Welcome back. On uh, this episode of the Mindful Money Podcast, I'm chatting with Tom Corley, who's a CPA, CFP, has a master's in tax, and is the best-selling author of the Rich Habits series of books, including Rich Habits, Rich Kids, Change Your Habits, Change Your Life, Rich Habits, Poor Habits, and Effortless Wealth. His work has been seen by 100 million people in 27 countries. I've been reading his kind of tough love money message myself for about 10, maybe 15 years. And I'm happy to have him on the show today. Tom, welcome to the Mindful Money Podcast. Hey, Jonathan, how you doing, my friend? It's good to I'm be on. Well. I'm glad. So where do you call home and uh, where are you connecting from? Yeah, so I was originally born and raised in New York and now live down by the Jersey Shore in uh, Long Branch. We're a couple of blocks from the beach. And, you know, I just, my office is in Aberdeen, Matawan, New Jersey. I don't know if you know what that is, but sort of, uh, they call it over the bridge, exit 117, 118 on the Garden State Parkway. That's how people measure where you are in New Jersey. So, yeah, so we've got a CPA firm here, financial planning firm, and I do my rich habits, author work and my speaking business and all that stuff right from yeah. here. Have you spent, it sounds like you like spent your whole life on the East Coast. Have you spent any time in any other part of the country? Well, I think the East Coast is it in terms of living. Yeah. You know, I've been, I've been relocated a few times working for big companies. So didn't like that, but mostly in the East Coast, you know, but traveled all over the country, mainly because of the rich habits, you know, as I also traveled a little bit when I was an assistant tax director, I had had responsibility over about a thousand people in the States and Puerto Rico and in Canada. So did a, quite a bit of traveling in those areas. And, you know, my speaking stuff has taken me all over, not just the United States, but Vietnam, Australia, Ireland. So it's been pretty cool. I have to say, I really enjoy this journey that I'm on. Yeah. I'm always curious about, you know, talking to finance people, what they learned about money as a kid. Yeah, I, I just, what's the financial story that you had growing up? Well, you know, my story is an interesting one because we were rich and then we were, we weren't <laughs> my father's it's a long story, but in short, my father's, uh, tool distributor business, which he owned most of the East coast, Sears, JC Penney is there was a hardware store. I can't remember the name. It's just all of the big names back then he distributed tools to and his warehouse burned to the ground. And, and in short, we, you know, we over almost overnight, we became poor. And so what I experienced growing up, you know, that I was nine years old when that happened, but I tell this story a lot because it did shape my money story. you oftentimes, not oftentimes, almost always the things that happen to you as a child, follow you into adulthood. It's not just, you know, the emotional experiences, it's the habits, the habits that are forged in childhood from, you know, most of our habits come from our parents and from mentors and from people that are in our inner circle as we become adults. But I remember when I was in the eighth grade and, you know, we were graduating and I had, I shoveled snow and I mowed lawns and I did all that sort of stuff to make money because there was no money in our house. And I saved up about. $150. And I remember I told a bunch of close friends, probably about 15 of them that I was going to have a eighth grade graduation party. And then I, you know, I mentioned it to my mother about like a kid, you know, two weeks before. <laughs> and she's like, we can't have a graduation party. We don't have any money. And I said, well, I saved up $150 from all the work I was doing. And almost immediately, as soon as that, the words came out of my mouth, that 150 was gone, you know, so I had to cancel the party. I had a second experience where I started working right after I graduated college and I saved up about $4,000 because I wanted to buy, they had a car, a cool car back when I was just graduated co college, it was called the Ford Fiero. It was Jonathan, the coolest looking car. And I was convinced it was a chick magnet. And so I saved up $4,000 and somehow my mother found out about it. And the next thing I knew I was giving that $4,000 to my father. So the money lesson I learned growing up was don't save, because if you save somebody in your poor family is going to take that money from you. And that is actually a very common story among poor people. That's why poor people struggle as adults saving money, because they have forged a habit 
of getting rid of any money that they have because they're going to, somebody's going to take it from them. Yeah. And uh, you're going to give it up voluntarily if there's love in your heart. And, and you just, you know, that's just the nature of, of, of being a good human being. And so, but that's the lesson that you learn as uh, growing up poor. And that stayed with me. It took me a while to, to shake, shake free of that. Yeah. I remember actually the Ford Fiero. It, it was not the coolest car. <laughs> Just, I'm going to push back on that a little bit. <laughs> you know, it had the flip up lights. Yeah, you know, I remember. I the, only, the only other car that had that was the Mazda RX-7. Which was a cooler and, car. Which I ended up getting a oh, used good. later on in life because I guess because I didn't get my Fiero or whatever. But that was, yeah, that was my dream car. That was my dream wow. car. Well, in college, that's an interesting dream car. Tell us, you know, you learn this really, you know, striking lesson as a kid. How does that translate into your career? Your entrepreneurial, you mentioned you work for some larger tax firms. How, yeah. how does that translate into, I'm going to develop this career path in finance? Well, I, I think I went into accounting. It's really a simple story. I was beginning my sophomore year in, in college and I was working as a janitor 20 hours a week. We didn't have any money for college. So the school I worked for, Curtis High School, they were public schools, New York public school. And they were so kind. They said, look, you can work from 3.30 to like 8, basically giving me about 20 hours a week that way, and then go to school full time. So that's what I did. And I remember I was in my so beginning of my sophomore year, and I said to my dad, you know, I've got to pick, I've got to matriculate. I've got to pick a major. And he said, pick accounting. You'll never starve. And he meant it. You know, you know, parents always want their kids to be okay as adults, you know, functioning adults and not to worry, you know, they, he, they didn't have any money and they, they couldn't help me. So it was, you know, you've got to pick a good major that allows you to live a middle-class or upper middle class lifestyle because otherwise you're going to struggle in life. So it meant a lot to me. Not you know, not we never starved, Jonathan. So I don't I want to you know dispel that notion. We didn't have food scarcity, but we were always on the verge of being homeless. You know, it was just a thing we always worried about. But it meant a lot to me when he said that. So I didn't particularly like it. I'm still not crazy about it. I like what we can do in helping people and businesses. I like that part of it, adding value to the lives of others through our knowledge and our skill sets that I like, but you know, the science of accounting, you know, it's boring and everybody who's involved in it will tell you the same thing. They, they yep. it's not a surprise to anyone who's in it. But critical. It's boring. It's but a critical. critical. It's a, and boy, let me tell you, when it comes to business, having an accounting background, my God, I can, within a minute, I can look at a financial statement and I could see where the, all, yep. all the skeletons are buried. And yep. so that's an important skill set to have if you're running a business. And so I think that gave me a bit of an advantage in terms of, you know, pursuing the entrepreneurial path, I guess, because I knew financial statements and I knew how all that stuff worked. And it's, you know, I'm able to take that with me into the different businesses that I have and apply all of that. And it's been a real big asset to me. Yeah. Okay. So grew up with kids, some of the, as kids, the difficult experiences, not a lot of money end up being, I think, pretty successful as a CPA at a national accounting firm, have the entrepreneurial mm -hmm. bug. Where does that lead to studying the wealthy? Like, how did that happen? Well, so I took over Surface and Company as a CPA firm back in 2004. And I think almost immediately, it was like within the first three or four months, I had this client who I didn't know. They wanted to meet with me, a business client, and they were, it was urgent. So I had to meet with them at like eight o'clock one night. And they came to my office and this guy, big guy, big burly guy, and he had a auto repair, auto body shop or something like that. And he, you know, he was very intimidating figure in, in the office anyway, everybody was intimidated by him. And I remember Charlotte, who worked for us at the time, said, oh, my God, nobody likes to deal with him. And so I'm like, oh, great. So I meet with this guy, and he's is very intimidating. Big guy, 6'4", something like that, you know, 280 pounds, something like, like that on that range. And, and he sat down. He says, you're my accountant. You've been the accountant for this company when my father owned it and then when I took over. And so, you know, now I need you to help me get a line of credit. And I said, okay, I'll you know, I have some business, some banking relationships. I'll, you know, I'll make some phone calls. And he says, well, I need it by this Friday. 
I think it was Tuesday. I said, well, that's not going to happen. And he got mad at me. And, you know, and so I said, you're just going to have to calm down. I said, if we're going to have a conversation as adults, you're going to have to calm down. And so he did. And I explained to him that banking relationships take months, years to develop. I said, you're not going to get a line of credit from any of my banking relationships. I promise you that, not by Friday. I can absolutely dispel that notion from your head. Never going to happen. And I said, if you think that that's a shortcoming of me, fine, go to somewhere else. Go to another accounting firm. Go to anywhere. You'll, they'll tell you the same thing. It's impossible. So at that point, he started, he broke down, he started crying, and I realized there was more to this story. And he, he, what happened was his, he took over the business from his father and, you know, he did a good job, but he got divorced. And when he got divorced, he started tapping into his line of credit. And that over a 10 year period, it grew to, I think it was close to $400,000. He was basically taking $40,000 a year for, you know, I talk about in the book, Rich Habit, for not such good reasons, you know, prostitutes and things like that. It was stupid. And, but it wasn't a lot of money a year, but it added up, you know, his salary as an auto repair, auto body guy should have been around 125,000, but it was 165,000. And he would draw from the line of credits, you know, and bring it into the business. And then he would pay himself a salary and then we use some of that money for nefarious purposes, bad habits, really not nefarious, but just bad habits that he had. And so he broke down, started crying and he told me the whole story. And, and I said, you know, and he said to me, what are your successful clients doing that I'm not doing? What am I doing wrong? What, are, you know, you, what are the, what's causing me to fail? And it took me a while to figure out that he was spending $40,000 a year on this stuff. And it happened at a lunch that we had. And I, I realized I was asking him all the wrong questions all these months trying to figure out what was wrong with this business. Nothing was wrong with this business. He was paying himself too much and he was using that money for stupid reasons. And so I started, I realized I was asking him all the wrong questions. And then I, I had a light bulb moment, you know, the aha moment. There's got to be some information out there on, on the web as to what, why some people are rich and some people are poor. And I started looking at everything and I got this book called The Millionaire Next Door. Yep. I read through Thomas that. Stanley. Yep, Dr. Thomas and, Stanley. Uh, yeah, it was a good book, but it didn't answer the question of, you know, most of the people in that book were doing pretty well. And he didn't get, peel the onion in terms of where did they start? How did they get to where they were? He just sort of highlighted certain attributes, data points about, you know, the individuals who were truly wealthy and the individuals who just had a high income, you know? So it didn't help me. And I, that aha moment I had was I, I've got to do my own research on this. Got it. And so being a CPA, we're really good with numbers, you know, that and data. So I, it took me a while, but I came up with a list of what I call my 20 question list, but it's really 144 questions broken up into 20 categories. And over a five-year period, I asked 233 wealthy people and 128 poor people these 144 questions. And I gathered all this data, transferred it over to Excel worksheets, and then summarized it into what's become known as my Rich Habits Research Summary. And I, you know, I lean on that research summary all the time for my articles and, and for other things, but it's uh, really such a valuable, valuable yeah. tool. It, and basically in three columns, because there's a rich column, poor column, and then there's the self-made millionaire column. Because out of the 233 millionaires, I think 24% of them were had inherited their money, right? And so they weren't self-made. Yeah, 170, yeah. 177 of the 233 individuals were self-made. They came from either poverty or the middle class. Yeah, I've heard you reference that number. I Actually, I think I heard you reference 87% in preparation for this. I think I heard you in an yeah. interview say yeah, 87% millionaire. Yeah, there's, so I think the real value, the real value is in the 177 self-made millionaires. Totally. You know, and, and the poor people and the poor people. You know, I always like to say, because most of this, I'm in this self-help, self-personal development space yep. with Tony Robbins and, and Robin Sharma and all these other people that I've met doing speaking gigs. And uh, they always focus on what wealthy people do, what successful people do. And I always say, that only gets you halfway down the football field. Yep. You have to know, it's nice to know what to do, but you also have to know what not to do, right? That what not to do and that what to do 
is how you score touchdowns and how you become successful in life. Because you can have all the rich habits in the world, Jonathan, but if you have an equal number of poor habits, you're going to be on a treadmill. You're going to be running really hard and going nowhere and scratching your head and, and saying, you know, what am I doing wrong? Like that one client said, what are successful people doing that I'm not doing? You know, they in this current environment, political environment, you know, our economic environment, I think that statistic, 87% of millionaires start with nothing. You know, they don't inherit it. They built it themselves. I think that's hopeful. You know, should we, should we take hope from that and be more hopeful? Yeah. And in, in a free country, in a country that, you know, in a socialist or communist country, rich habits mean nothing. They're meaningless. Right. You know, in a free market economy, in a, in a country that embraces the free market system, yes, anyone can become wealthy. And in America, what's, you know, what the politicians, they, in order to get votes, because let's face it, most people are living in poverty or the middle class. In order to gain votes, they have to appeal to the poor class or the middle class. And uh, the best way to do that is, you know, to tell them it's not your fault. You know, and we're going to go after the the bad, evil people who are the wealthy people because they're right. holding you back. The Wall Street, you know, the wealthy people, you know, they're the reason you're poor and stuck in the middle class. And that's not true. In America, most of the people who become wealthy, you know, there's a bell curve if, when you're talking about millionaires. And in that bell curve, that 99% of the millionaires, they have between, this is why I ch chose 3.2 million as the starting point, the, the benchmark, the threshold, if you will, for evaluating whether or not somebody's wealthy, 3.2 million to about 10 million is that 99%. That's it. You know, there's outliers who have, you know, significantly more money and there's outliers on the other side that have less than 3.2 million and still are wealthy because of their standard of living. But, you know, the, in that bell curve, that's it. That's those you know, that's most of the millionaires. And so I'm trying to appeal to those people and those people, almost, almost all of them, 88, depending on, you know, the wealth X report that comes out every year that vacillates between 78% and 85%, 86% are self-made. They come from poor, you know, poverty or, or middle class. In my rich habits study, I think that was 76% came from poverty or the middle class. So, you know, you've, I'm trying to appeal to those people with yep. my rich habits. I'm not going, if you want to become a billionaire like Elon Musk or, or Zuckerberg, don't, don't, you know, the rich habits are only going to get you so far. They'll help you, no doubt about it. But what is going to make you a billionaire is luck. Right. You have to have an enormous amount of luck. Right. It's, it's just the facts. It's, you know, luck is a, the number one ingredient to becoming a billionaire. Right. No, I and totally so, agree with that. Yeah. So, but not those, that bell curve, not that 99%. It's not luck. Uh, you create your own luck in the form of what I call opportunity, good luck. And that's by having good habits, uh, pursuing opportunities, calculated risks, education, educated risks, not lottery risk type risks, not gambling right. type risks. You create the opportunity for good luck to occur in your life by doing certain specific things every single day over and over and over again. And one of those things is you read to learn whatever it is in your industry. You've got to become uh, almost expert in what you do, have that expert knowledge. If you're skill-based, you need to have that expertise, that virtuoso skill set. So, you know, it depends on what you do for a living, but you have to practice if it's a skill set and you have to read if you're a knowledge virtuoso. That's, you know, what I've been trying to share and get the information out to that group, that bell curve of people that want to, you know, want to become millionaires, like those millionaires between 3.2 million and 10 million. Yeah. The, the majority of millionaires, like the normal, you know, run of the mill millionaire, you know, I read your work academically more or less, right? These habits work. These habits don't. If you want to be really successful, try these success habits. Mm -hmm. And I find myself wondering if you get any pushback or criticism for it. Oh boy, when I was on the Dave Ramsey show, you know, he had me scheduled for one segment, which in the radio world is uh, like five minutes or something like that. And he had me on the show because Yahoo Finance had interviewed me and they came out with the, the interview and the interview went viral. In fact, it was uh, Farnoosh Tarabe. I have to thank her for, for introducing me to the world or introducing the world to me. 
so Farnoosh, in that, when I was doing the interview, I remember asking her, Kate, her producer, I said, you know, what's like the hit rate that I can expect on this? And she said, well, if you get 50,000 hits, then it's really good. I said, well, how much is the most that you ever had? And she said, oh, we've had as much as 400,000 hits. And I was a little deflated, Jonathan, to be honest with you, because this is Yahoo Finance. I figured they had millions and millions. So anyway, the, the interview came out in, I think it was July. The interview came out in July, right? Mid-July. And within 24 hours, we had 2 million hits on it. And that is actually when I knew that my rich habits struck a nerve, that there was a need. Up until that point, I just, to me, it was just an obsession, I guess. I thought that this was something that could change people's lives, that people would be interested in. But when I, after that Yahoo Finance interview went viral, and then one of the listeners or watchers, whatever, was Dave Ramsey. And I remember the day, it was like July 13th or something. And I remember coming home late from a client meeting. And I think it was nine o'clock and my wife, I walked in the door and my wife said to me, some guy named Dave Ramsey has been trying to get a hold of you. And I go, Dave Ramsey. And I'm thinking in my head, I don't have any clients named Dave Ramsey, right? And I said, he goes, no, he's on the radio. He's yep. been talking about you all day today. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? And she goes, yeah, yeah. So I went downstairs, got online and Dave archives his shows at the end of the show. So I listened to his show that day and I said, holy crap. He had like, was talking about my rich habits for like an hour. And he said, we got to get this guy on the show. And his, and his producer, I finally got in touch with his producer. And so funny thing is I, I called that night and I got Rachel, his daughter. And she said, oh, my dad's been trying to get a hold of you. And she gave me the producer's name and I called him the next day. And that Friday I was on the Dave Ramsey show. I was supposed to be on for five minutes that they told me, they were adamant about that. It was going to be five minutes. That's it. So, you know, Dave's going to ask you certain things. You got to make your points. And they were nervous about me because they didn't know me. And you're always nervous. So well, as a radio host, I would be too. So what he got comfortable with me in about a minute and we were on for a half an hour and mm. he has 8.8 .8 million listeners. Yep. And I got a call like after the, I was done with the interview cause it's live. And uh, it was my friend, Bill King. He's a CPA. And he said, I nearly drove my car off the road. I was listening to the Dave Ramsey show. And then here's my best friend, Tom Corley is on the Dave Ramsey show. It was comical. I got calls from everywhere. People were like, like I was like, hey, man, this guy is really powerful. He has a lot of yeah, listeners. Does. That opened the door. And the next thing I knew, I think, Jonathan, I think I sold 30,000 books in a week. And that month, maybe 50,000. And I had just one stupid book out. Yep. A paperback. That was it on Amazon. I had no ebooks. I had no audio books. I had no books written in Chinese, you know, complex or simple. I had one book and it exploded on Amazon. I was ranked, the people, a lot of people don't know this about Amazon, but you are only truly a best selling author when you break the top 100 in Amazon in that country. Amazon has different locations yep. around the world. In the United States, I broke the top 100 and I, I was actually at number seven. Number seven, I was ahead of Tony Robbins. He had come out yeah. with a finance book. I don't know if you remember that finance book he came out with. I was ahead of Tony Robbins. I was ahead of Dave Ramsey's own book. I think uh, the only one that was, the one author was ahead of me for two books and it was uh, J.K. Rollins. Oh, wow, yeah, and she sold millions, that's good. So did you, I'm going back to the question, from the Dave Ramsey show or from the other things, did you get any criticism for it? Were there people that said like, this is crazy? Yeah, so or... just, sorry, I went off on a tangent there. That's so okay. what happened after the Dave Ramsey show is CNN just went hostile on Dave Ramsey and I. And this is proof that the, the media actually does no work at all. They kept referring to me as Tim Corley. Now my brother, Tim Corley works for the DEA. Oh, wow. So that pissed him off a little bit. And so I had to call up CNN and I said, you, you got to, stop with the Tim Corley crap. He's a high level DEA agent. Stop. My name's Tom Corley. Do your homework. They listened to the damn show and then they couldn't even get my name right. So, and Dave Ramsey was for two days, he was talking about the fallout. I mean, they were ripping us about 
how we were beating up on poor people. I wrote the book for poor people. I was poor. Don't tell me what I'm doing. I'm helping poor people. They were just spinning it to fit the narrative, which is poor people are good and wealthy people are bad. And that's all there is to it. It's black and white. And they did not like the fact that we were holding poor people personally responsible for their poverty. They did not like that at all. Right. And uh, I spent probably six or seven hours responding, stupid of me, but I did, responding to all the comments on CNN. And there were thousands and thousands of comments. I had the, probably 10 people that I would not let off the hook. And I kept going back at them. And they finally raised a white flag. And they said, we surrender. We're not going to argue with you anymore because they couldn't win the argument. And, but that was what, yeah, the feedback, fallback, fallout. Oh my God. Yeah, Dave, Dave Ramsey will not ever have me on his show again. Never. Not in a million years after that, because, you know, he had, you know, I can only imagine what he went through. Me, what I went through, he's a celebrity. What he yep. must have gone through, I can't imagine like the advertisers, what they must have been saying behind the, you know, the closed doors. Oh my God. But it was, it was really, really bad. And so yeah. I mean, going back, I do read it academically and I've read it for 15 years now. And I think it's like, all you did was say, here's good habits, here's bad habits, follow some good habits and it'll be beneficial for you. Right. Mm -hmm. So what do you say to folks when they say, you know, oh, I can't do it. It's too hard. You know, you, Tom, you don't understand my struggle. What do you mm -hmm. say to those who suggest that you're, that you are blaming people for the lack of success? Well, I have so many, I have a whole, one of those brown binders filled with comments, emails, and stuff that I get from people all over the world that have told me how the rich habits have completely transformed their lives. Mm -hmm. So all I can say to those people is, look, perhaps you're doing it wrong because I always highlight the importance of starting small. You can't, like I had a friend of mine, Pat, who he runs a big insurance agency. And he said, you know, he called me up one morning. He said, he goes, ah, I'm so down right now. And I said, what's the matter, Pat? He goes, well, Remember that rich habits list that you and I created? I think I created like eight things. We collaborated and we came up with eight rich habits that were sort of specific for his industry, you know, for him and his, his career. And I told him then, I said, just, you know, follow one or two of these initially, maybe one. And he said, you know, I have been doing this for three months and I'm uh, having a 40% success rate. I said, what do you mean a 40% success rate? He goes, well, I'm only able to follow, you know, three out of the eight rich habits at a time consistently. And I said, Pat, I said, I've never tackled more than one rich habit at a time. I said, are you out of your frigging mind? I said, I told you one or two rich habits at a time. It's impossible to do more than that. It's just, it's, you're going to give up. He goes, well, that's what I feel like doing, giving up. So we pivoted and I, I told him, all I want you to do is focus on this one rich habit. This is the only thing I want you to focus on. Ignore all of the rest. Mm. And then when it becomes a habit, because you have to understand how habits work, and I do. The way habits work is when you start a new behavior that you want to forge to become a habit, the group of neurons lights up in your brain. Now, when that behavior, when you start repeating it, after a couple of weeks, it takes a couple of weeks of repetitive behavior, the basal ganglia, which is in the sort of a golf ball size mass of nerve cells in the brain, sends up a dentrite. It's how you receive information through dentrites. The axons send information, dentrites receive information. So the basal ganglia sends up a dentrite because the, the prefrontal cortex says there's something going on in the brain. This may be a habit. The brain likes habits, wants to form as many habits as possible. So it instructs the basal ganglia, send up a dentrite, see what's going on sends up a dentrite, does a reconnaissance mission for about two or three weeks. And then the dentrite communicates back to the prefrontal cortex. This is, this could be a habit. And so the prefrontal cortex says, okay, designated as a habit. So then the dentrite becomes a permanent fixture, like building a highway in the brain. Once that happens, and it takes about six, depends on the habit, but you can form a habit overnight. Don't get me wrong. You can, but most habits take about six weeks to forge. Really hard habits like learning how to swing a tennis racket or a golf, or hit a golf ball or hit a slice if you want to, or, or a hook if you want to, those things take longer. But the average run of the mill, plain vanilla habits, they take about six weeks for the neurons 
to be marked by the basal ganglia as a habit. And once they're marked as a habit, they're marked forever. Now, where a habit can be formed overnight is when the emotional center of the brain, where the behavior gets the attention of the emotional center of the brain, yeah. then the emotional center of the brain, not the prefrontal cortex, communicates to the basal ganglia and says, send up a dentrite right away and mark it as a habit. We like this. Now, think of cell phones, right? You literally can download the TikTok app and become addicted overnight. Well, that's because you've activated the emotional center part of the brain and it instructed the basal ganglia. We don't want any reconnaissance mission. Make it a habit immediately. And why is does the emotional center have that power? Because the emotional center of the brain has been around millions and millions and millions of years longer than the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is relatively new. I would say it's 600 to 700,000 years old yeah. in terms of humanity. Yeah, and we're still uh, figuring it out. Yeah, yeah. So the emotional center of the brain, which is the limbic system and the brain stem, have been around for, you know, since humanity has been, you know, been around. So it's gotten far more powerful. And so it has, it, and you can, you want to know how I know that this is true? When, if you've ever seen car accidents and the victims of the car accidents, there's videos on this, they go into a state of shock. What is a state of shock? A state of shock is when your prefrontal cortex is shut down. Right. Why does your brain shut down the prefrontal cortex? Because the fight or flight system takes over. That's the limbic system and the brain stem for survival purposes. It doesn't want the prefrontal cortex to evaluate or think, or, you know, maybe I should go do this or maybe it shuts it down. It says you're out of the picture. This is about survival. And the person goes into shock. That's how powerful that part of those two parts of the brain are. They literally can shut down your consciousness, shut down your consciousness. Amazing. Hey, I'm curious because this actually brings up a whole nother topic and I didn't intend to go here, but re, you know, in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of research on people who exist in poverty simply can't make the rational decision. They simply can't because they're, it's a poverty mind. It pulls away the ability. So is that what is that what you're saying? Is that yeah, we're stuck in our amygdala? We're stuck. Here's what's going on with poor people. Yeah. We all have bandwidth, meaning our brains have certain bandwidth or capacity to deal with things during the day. This is decision making. This is, you know, analytical stuff, choices. Our, we only have so much bandwidth. What happens with poor people is their bandwidth is taken up predominantly by financial emergencies. They're constantly under financial duress and they're worried. They're thinking constantly about this bill, about that bill, something went wrong. Maybe the furnace broke. How am I going to fix it? So their bandwidth is taken up by all this stuff. Now, when your bandwidth is taken up, that means you don't have the cognitive ability to right. think your way out of a problem. That's why it's so hard when you're poor to break out of poverty because you don't have the bandwidth. I can tell you, well, I wrote Rich Habits for poor people. Almost no one who's poor has read Rich Habits. I think out of you know the 500,000 books that I might have sold around the world, I bet you about 1,000 were purchased by poor people. They just don't have the time. And yep. I, I learned this. This is, you know, as an author, a new author, I didn't, you know, my demographic, my target market was poor people. It turns out the people that were buying my book were people in, in the middle class on the verge of being upper middle class. They were the lion's share and rich people, people that were not uber rich, but rich. The uber rich don't have any, won't have anything to do with my rich habits. Yeah. The people that are just about wealthy or getting wealthy and want to get more wealth. These are the people that are, you know, buying all of the, the books. So have you done, is there anything we can do to reach out to the poor people? Is there, what do we do then to help those people? Cause I think I have that, that's kind of my, what I, I'd like to help them too. I come from poverty as well, sort of like you do. So how do we, how do we reach them? Well, that's why I have been, I guess my mission has been since I figured this out in 2012, that I needed to a better way to get to communicate to poor people. I started a, what I call conquer the media. And that's TV, radio, internet, and print. So I have been, you know, I like to say the author business, writing a book is like the first serve in tennis. Mm -hmm. The rest of the match is about promotion, is about promoting the book. 
So I've been devoting, you know, I write every day. I have my, my hour and a half, two hours a day that I write. That's never going to change. But I, sp- I also spend about two or three hours a day dealing with the media. And so, you know, I just had an article that came out in Success Magazine, this April, May edition. I try and keep the relationships in the media because I believe Success Magazine is a bad example, but CNN, CNBC, ABC, Yahoo Finance, the, you know, a lot of even poor people get those feeds on their phone. Uh, TikTok, you know, I, I have, I don't actually promote myself on TikTok, but I have people that do that just without me even knowing who they are. And if that's helping, you know, I tried Twitter. I've been, I've been a big advocate of Twitter because it's poor people don't have a lot of bandwidth. They, and 144 characters works for them. Yep. That's why, that's one of the reasons Twitter is so successful because people have limited bandwidth and they, you know, Twitter just fills that need, that void that they have, the limitation that they have. So I've been, I realized that early on and I said, Twitter is going to be my main thing. And so I get, I do a lot of very active on, on Twitter. So, and Twitter is what got me the Yahoo finance interview. Oh, cool. I mean, you know, so it's, and it introduced me to Michael Yardney, who's a co-author of Rich Habits, Poor Habits. Yep. And. I've done speaking engagements in Australia because of it. So it's been a very valuable tool, tool for me. So that's what I've been doing. Besides that, speaking engagements wherever I can, you know, in, in poorer neighborhoods, I, I do that. So I hope that we can help a little bit with spreading the message, you know, our little, do our little part. I know that, and I'd recommend this, right? You're, there's a list of 300 behaviors and ideas that are your rich habits, you know, research summary. And I recommend people go and grab that and sign up for the daily. Like I've been getting the daily for a decade and, you know, I don't, read it every day, but every day I read it, I, you know, it's interesting. It's helpful. It's, oh, here's just one habit, work on this one thing. And so I think it's very beneficial for the listeners. You know, our purpose, the purpose of this podcast, similar to your purpose is to help people who have sort of limited access to professional advisors like us to start making better financial decisions. So I like to ask two very specific questions and you've kind of begun this a little bit, but just very simple in the simplest way possible. What are the two, I was going to say three, but what are the two habits that people can start working on today, this week, that will improve their outcomes and their financial well-being? Well, so everybody, even poor people work, they may not be thrilled at the job that they have, but I would say to the poor people, if there's anybody listening, is what would you like to do, right? Make a list, make a list of 10 things, other careers that you would like, and then spend six months and immerse yourself in reading about everything about that career. Learn everything you can. Do an hour a day. I know you have limited bandwidth. You don't have a lot of time. But remember, this is an investment in yourself, right? So this is one hour. If you can't do an hour, do do five minutes. But my point is, make it a habit every day of reading something related to that one particular career path that you think you would like to do. Do that for six months. The next six months, what's number two on your list? The next six months, what's number three? So find what you, the reason I'm saying do this is because what I've learned from my research is that it takes about six months for you to figure out if this is something you're really passionate about. Why? Because after six months, you're either going to drop it and move on to the next thing and start studying that, or you're going to say, screw that. I want to learn more. That's when you know you've tapped into something. This is an innate talent you might possess that's been exposed to this process. And then you're going to say, I'm not, I don't need to look at anything else on my list. I'm going to devote myself to really understand everything about this industry because I really dig this industry. I think I could do this. I really like it. And that's the passion is, is the brain's way of alerting you to the existence of an innate talent that you possess. So that's what I would tell the poor people is just do that. Reading is, is important. You don't have a lot of time. You don't have a lot of bandwidth. I understand that devote five minutes at a minimum and maybe more and, and just keep at it. And eventually you'll find something and might be even in your industry. You might say, well, you know, I don't hate what I do for a living, but I don't make a lot of money at it. Well, then learn everything about the industry. See if you actually really like the industry that you're in, right? Read every day, learn every day about the industry, learn more and more and more, read books about people that are in the industry. And the more you figure out about the industry, the more you'll learn whether or not this is the right career path for you. And when, here's the interesting thing. When you do find that thing that makes your heart sing, that's when your life is going to change. Yep. And you'll be surprised 
at how much time all of a sudden you have available to do the diligence and the reading because you're going to be passionate about it. And you're not going to sit and watch Netflix to, you know, as a means of escaping what is your life. You're not going to want to do that because you are know now you're going to be creating a new life because passion has just told you you may have an innate talent in a particular field. And if it's skill-based, then you maybe reading isn't what you need to do. Maybe it's practice. It's not, maybe it is. If it's skill-based, you have to practice. Same rule, six months, practice some skill. If you really like it, you won't move on after the six months. You won't be able to, your brain won't allow you to. If you are able to move on after the six months, it's because your brain says, yeah, this skill I'm not too crazy about. Right. And I know that there's a, the flip side of that coin, right? There's a lot of temptation, distraction, and noise out there. Netflix, you mentioned, right? Can you describe like, what is the one bad habit or the two bad habits that really get in our way that if we just, we can decide tomorrow, Hey, let's not do this thing anymore. Then I would say the news, reading the news. If you read the news on a regular basis, you're wasting your time. The news is all crafted to create, to stir the negative emotional center of the brain. It's to create fear, anxiety. That seems to be the way that they get readers. It's the, been the, the, the thing that's been the most successful for them. And uh, there's nothing that you are able going to be able to do to change uh, world events and national events. You can't change your government by, by listening to the news. How you can change your government is by becoming successful in whatever it is that you want to do and then using your resources to help move mountains, right? right? You can do it that way. But uh, you know, you, yeah, wait, you're wasting your time if you're listening to the news. I'm shocked at that. Like I, I sort of have a gut sense that that's probably true. And I also am very, very pulled to listen to the news and to read things and to you know, check out what's going on in the economy and this and that and the other thing. And, and it's a very constant daily pull. And so the, the other off. thing I want to mention is most people have an inner circle. If your inner circle is filled with a bunch of negative people, you're going to, they're going to infect you with their negative habits, their poor habits. So you want to start associating with people that have the habits, the life, the habits, the, the you know, the, the things that you want in your life. You want to start associating with those types of people that have right. those things because they're going to infect you with their habits and uh, habits spread like a virus throughout our social networks. That's a fact. And you want to alter your inner circle, push out or devote less time to the people in your inner circle who are negative, have a negative mindset and focus on people that have a positive mindset because they're the ones that are going to help lift you up out of the life that you're in and, and bring you up to the next level. Yeah. And if you, can, if you can find four or five people that are at your level, just above your level, and you guys hang out together, striving mm -hmm. for the next level, that's uh, yeah, that's a huge support. Yeah. yeah and you can hey, find them in the nonprofits, local community-based nonprofits. You can find them in gyms. Yep. You know, oh, if you can afford a gym, you know, that, those kind of clubs, any clubs that you have around you, that's, you know, most of the nonprofit groups are really, really good people that are running them. So. Yep. Yep. So what, I'm just, Couple of wrapping questions here. What was the last thing, Tom, that you changed your mind about? Dogs. Dogs. I hated dogs. Now I love dogs. My kids <laughs> got dogs. My kids got dogs. The second thing is TikTok. I hated the idea of TikTok. And now I have a routine every day. It's usually in the bathroom where I'm watching uh certain, you know, if you follow TikTok, if you like something on TikTok, it'll it'll feed you that more of that yep. stuff. So of course, you know, what do I like, you know, self-help and stuff like that. And I'm also into science fiction and uh, UFOs and things like that. So I find TikTok that, you know, the few minutes that I have in the bathroom, that's my, I can't believe that I'm actually doing it, but I do it. And yeah, it's careful. not a rich habit. Bad habit <laughs> creeping in, careful. <laughs> and listen, if you're going to have a poor habit, you know, make it only a couple minutes long, I guess is is my recommendation. Right. Is there anything that people don't know or often don't remember about you that you really want them to remember and know? Yeah, I think like people have this perception because I'm a CPA, I'm a financial planner, I have a master's degree in tax that, you know, I must be one of those privileged few. I came from poverty. I worked as a janitor to get my way through college. And if I can do it, and I came from a, a household, you know, that was rich and then was poor. And let me tell you, rich is great. Being poor sucks. And I want people to know that I know what both sides are like, and you've got to do whatever you can to get out of poverty. It is not how human beings were supposed to be. 
You know, and I hate to say it, but there's an element in society. I call it the deep state, but I don't want to get into that. But there are, you know, they, and I write about it. I've, I've written on articles about it, how, you know, there's, it's institutionalized that, the, you know, they've, there are certain, there's an agenda out there and they want more poor people than they want rich people. And you've got to fight that. It's the, you know, the deck is stacked against you in a lot of ways, but I'm an example that you can break free of it. I did. And, uh, you know, I could have been a janitor the rest of my life. I was actually my favorite job that I've ever had, but I chose to continue a life of improvement. And I guess that led me to the rich habits research. And, and here I am, you know, and if I can do it, anybody can do it. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing I want to point out, I started out in life with, uh, I'm writing an article about this now with an, a 90 IQ. I got tested when I was a kid only because my brother, Timmy had 140 IQ. So they tested both of us. They tested me for a reason. Cause they thought I was real, you know, maybe something wrong with me. My <laughs> IQ, I got tested on my IQ in 1993. I, I didn't have a choice. My company made me get tested. I didn't want to, because I was nervous about it. And I tested at 136. Huh. And, and so for anybody out there that says I'm not smart enough, that's bunk. Your IQ increases depending on how much you use your brain. Wow. It increases over time. I'm an example of that. That's great. I that's I hadn't heard that. That's awesome. So tell us uh, how people can connect with you. Yeah, just richhabits.net. You go on there and you can subscribe to my daily uh, blog. And I have some free eBooks you can download. And you know, I have you can get my research summary if you want. You just sign up and you get it. So yeah, that's I, the way. I recommend it. And we're going to make sure that's all in the show notes as well. I just cool. want to say, you know, Tom, thanks for coming on. It's been a great conversation. Well, thanks for having me on, Jonathan. I really do appreciate it. It was fun. All right. So if you have a second, I want to tease a future conversation, if you don't mind uh, asking mm -hmm. another couple of questions. Sure. Okay. So Tom, thanks for coming on. I, I wanted to just tease a future conversation with you, if you wouldn't mind doing this again at some point in the future. I think we're kind of the same generation. I've learned today that we have a similar background, different parts of the country, but come from very little and have built something. And while I do believe that there are years ahead of us, I imagine at some point, you know, or some points along the path, you sometimes think about slowing down. I do. If you don't mind, is there a time to consciously put the success habits down? Is there a time to stop seeking and enjoy life? Yeah, I think it, when we talk about rich habits, I'm talking about the habits that you're using to grow your wealth. So yes, there is a time. And that time is when you've decided that you have enough money that the passive income that you're generating from the wealth that you've accumulated is enough to sustain your standard of living, then you no longer need the success habits that are required to build wealth. But you may also, what I guess you call it retirement, right? But you may also, like I have a friend of mine who uh, retired and he's busier than ever because he's so involved in, in a bunch of nonprofits. There are certain rich habits that you can't, you know, dispense with if you're going to continue to be active. And, and you know, if you're working for nonprofits, that means you're, going, you're trying to help the nonprofit, you know, grow. And that means fundraisers. And that means, you know, you're basically getting money into the nonprofit any way you can. So that, that requires a certain skill set and certain rich habits. So you can't dispense with those. So I would say the rich habits that are specific to your ability to grow the wealth that you believe you need in order to create the passive income that you can dispense with those. So yeah, th those, that, you know, the maybe reading to learn about your industry no longer is necessary. If you're in the pharmaceutical industry, you don't need to read everything about the pharmaceutical industry. If you're not in it anymore, because you're retired, uh, you know, so tax, you know, when, if I ever retire from the CPA business, I, I, I won't have to read about taxes like I do every day. So yeah, so there's certain things that you can shift your reading to other things. And one of the things I will tell people is when you're thinking about at that point, I call it the, the retirement red zone. When you're in that red zone where you're thinking about retirement five years down the road, start picking up some new hobbies. Yeah. I just, I'm not in the retirement red zone. I'm never going to retire. I've decided I'm going to live to a hundred and I'm going to work till I'm 80, 85. And, but I did pick up a, a telescope. So that's a new hobby I'm going to start start diving into, pick up other hobbies along the way. But I think when you're getting to that retirement thinking age, start picking up hobbies because when you're retired, 
that big void has to be filled somehow and you need hobbies or nonprofits or something productive. Otherwise you're going to be unhappy. In yeah. And I think that's the crux of it is I, as I've, you know, I, I have clients the same as you have clients, right. And, and I walk them from work life to retirement life. Right. And then many of them retire and within a year they're back to work somewhere. Yeah. It's because we don't know how to, and this is one of the challenges I have with the uh, personally, not, you know, personally, I have this issue with the hustle culture, the build these habits culture, because how do you set it down? It's very difficult to set down once you're in motion because it's a habit, it's, right? They're habits. It's a habit. It's, they're hard to break, but I can tell you the, the quickest way to break a, a habit that you have is to change your environment. It's also the quickest way to forge a new habit is to change your environment. You know, where are the forks, where are the spoons, you know, you're in a new house. Where the hell do I, where's the step stool? You know, you start, you know, it's not where it used to be because the house is not the house you're living in. And I always say when you go on vacation is the, probably one of the best times to, to forge one new habit because you're in a new environment, a, a good habit, obviously not a bad habit, you know. <laughs> Oh, so, you know, when you're on vacation, you know, maybe forge a new habit, a reading habit or whatever, a new skill that you want to practice, you know, something like that. Yeah. So it's change your environment is probably the best way to get rid of a, an existing habit that, you know. So you should, when you retire, you should move. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we moved to down to the Jersey Shore from uh, Freehold, New Jersey. And oh my gosh, I, you know, it was, you know, you really, it really is forces you to now your, your prefrontal cortex has to think where everything goes and where everything right. is. And you develop new habits. I never had a shed before. Now I have a shed and I have all sorts of routines around that shed. I have, I built an Irish pub in my backyard. I have all sorts of new routines around that Irish pub, you know? So it's funny how changing your environment changes, changes your routines and it's quick. It's, it's a lot faster. We're, we're very adaptable. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. This has been fantastic. I hope to have another conversation at some point. Are you working on a new book? You can tell us about a new well, project. I finished, I finished what I thought was going to be a, a course. It's right now formulated to be a course. It's a course. It's called Wealth Academy, but I've been sitting on it for a year. <laughs> I don't know what, what I want to do with it. You know, because of the pandemic, what I want, really want to do is I want to have a, a Wealth Academy a three, four day seminar, if you will. Yep. But uh, I, I haven't decided yet. I, I could turn it into a book, but what, you know, I, Effortless Wealth was my latest book that I came out with. And of course it was released, you know, when you start a book, it's a year before and it was released right in the heart of the pandemic. And I was like, nobody's going to read this book. And it's like, I was de depressing for me, you know, and I, I have it out in other countries and it's, I'm selling, it's selling in other countries, but I can't, you know, I can't get, get it, you know, momentum on it in the States. And it's a great book, but it is what it is. What are you going to do? It is what it is. You'll write another one. Take this one, turn it into and keep That's the right. course, do the whole package, create a package. <laughs> right.